Welcome to the What's Happening Birmingham video podcast. Hello, everyone. This is John Sescott with What's Happening Birmingham today. I got the honor and pleasure a fellow UAB graduate, professional uh, professional football player, uh, Bryant Turner. He is now a local real estate agent here in our area. Bryant, thanks for going on the podcast today. Um, thanks for having, having me, man. I'm happy to be here and I'm um, happy to get us, you know, everything, all the questions answered that I can for sure today. Great, great, great. I want to especially thank him because he is on vacation right now and he's willing to come on the podcast to answer questions about what's going on in real estate right now. I feel like this market has been on fire since, you know, it's always on fire, but since the pandemic and now carrying over into this year, I um, want to bring him on, just ask him a few questions about how the mm -hmm. way he see the industry going, you know, right now. So the first kind of start off, kind of give people a little background bio on yourself. All right, so again, my name is Brian Turner Jr. Um, born and raised in Mobile, Alabama, end up moving to Daphne area, um, went to Daphne High School, played football there, went to left there, went on a scholarship to UAB, um, athletic scholarship, played football at UAB the next four years, um, graduated there. And basically I came out the, the year of the lockout season. I want to apologize for continuing to look left. I got my, my youngest daughter, who's three years old in the room with me. She's watching the movie right now. I'm just keeping an eye on her. But um, anyway, I, I left there um, 2010 at UAB, and I came out during the lockout season of the NFL. So basically, during that season, it was like if you got drafted, you were on a team. If you didn't get drafted, you didn't, it was no contact with the team. You really didn't have any idea of what was happening. So um, because of that reason, the next best thing for me was the Canadian Football League. Um, so they came calling. I basically ended up going up there. I um, ended up loving it. I, I stayed up there seven years, played five years with Winnipeg Blue Bombers, two years with BC Lions. Um, about two years before I stopped playing football, I knew I was coming to an end soon and started kind of looking for the next thing of what I was going to do. Um, ran into a guy. He kind of talked me into real estate, got into real estate, been in, you know, since two years before I quit, been full time now, a little bit over three years. And, you know, it's been going great. You know, I'm a little spoiled because I jumped in at the right time, but it's been going great, and I love what I do right now. Okay. Well, let's kind of jump in, and I right, congratulate you for making that, you know, smooth transition, you know, from playing professional sports to having your own thing. What is the first step in buying a home? In your All right, so the, in, in my opinion, the first step, well, it's kind of uh, A and B in <laughs> step mm -hmm. one. Um Probably the first thing you want to do always is going to be contact the agent. Mm -hmm. um, hire a, a realtor or agent for, you know, for buying a home. For one, you don't pay the realtor for when you're buying a house, you don't pay a realtor. So the realtor work for you, negotiate the contract, fill out every all the paperwork, basically walk, hold your hand and walk you through the process. And you don't pay them a dime normally. Um, we normally get paid by the seller of the house. Um, so it's always a good idea to hire a realtor when you're buying a house for sure, because you're not paying anything and you're getting all the benefit. Um, on the second part, you know, when you're selling, it's, um, you know, it can be a little, you can try to for sale by owner thing, but it's, it's honestly a lot more complicated and hard than a lot of people think, but I guess getting off subject. So anyway, that's going to be number one, get you an agent. The second, the, the number one B, that agent will help get you in touch with a lender. Cause if you're not buying cash, you're going to get a loan. And you really want that agent to have a relationship with your lender because it's a you want them to, to talk daily on what's going on or weekly or what's going on and keep you up to date. And you want a lender that's known to have, you know, have a good reputation to get the job done on time. And, you know, a lot of people are try to shop their loans around and, hey, this guy's rate a little bit lower. But then in the end, when that guy rate who was a little bit lower run late. It's, it costs you a lot of money to rearrange movers to, you know, renegotiate this contract. So it, it causes a lot of headache, basically. So that's going to be 1A and 1B. 1A is, is getting a realtor, finding somebody you trust. Um, 1B is going to be, you know, listening to that realtor and finding a great lender that they trust and that you will trust to get the job done. So I want to go to the next question I was going to ask you. That I know a lot of people always, how many houses should a person see before they decide? 
Well, honestly, it, it didn't kind of change. You know, when I first got in, I don't know, when I first got my license roughly five, six years ago or something like that, I remember somebody, the guy who was mentoring me, he was like, hey, I heard it was a multiple offer situation the other day, you know, and it was like a thing of, of you know, it was something that never happened. You know, um, you know, people don't get multiple offers at the same time. Anyway, it's the norm today. So, I mean, honestly, you want to you want to kind of have a great idea of what you, you know, want in the, in, you know, in the first house you go look at. Because if you love the first house, which a lot of people do, you know, because normally an agent hear what they're saying, they send them ideas of what they want. And we try to find that perfect house on the first one. If, you, you know, a lot of people think, hey, it's the it may be the one, but I want to see more. But when you go to see more, that one may be gone. You know what I mean? And now mm -hmm. you're back to square one and you can it can go another four or five months before you find that one again. So honestly, it, that's a hard question because it could be um, I'm under contract with a young lady right now. She's an attorney. It was the second house we looked at. And honestly, I knew it. You know, I knew it was the, the one, you know, it fit kind of everything she needed. Um, she wanted to see a couple more. And luckily it was, you know, we got back in in time and got under contract on the one. So we went and seen, I think, one or two more the next day. And she ended up putting off on the one that we we kind of both agreed to was the one. But um, so she looked at four total. You know, some people feel they have to look at 15 and 20. But honestly, by the time you get to that 15th one, 13 of those are gone by the time you see the 15th one. So you really don't have that much time in today's market to look at more than four or five without missing out on them. If that so makes how, sense. Does that make sense? So uh, the segue into my next one, how long is it taking now to close? Um, roughly 30 to 45 days is normal, um, on a closing time. Um, and, and most of the time is due to the lender. If you're truly pre-approved, which I would highly suggest, that's when you send all your documents in your W2, your, your tax return, everything they need in, they truly pre-approve you. Um, the lender, the, the main lender I use, they can normally get you done in 10 days after that. So you find the house, put a contract down, you know, the seller agreed to it. We can get you closed in 10 days. Um, however, you know, that's very unnormal. The normal thing is going to be 30 to 45 days. So, you know, now we're in 2021. Last year was 2020, of course, the pandemic and everything going on. And what I've been seeing, I guess you've seen, like you said, this is a great time to be in it. But it's so competitive now because everybody's looking for a home and there's several offers to like, like people tell me this is a seller's market right now. Right. What tell a person if they got multiple, they're competing against other people for that dream home they want. So what am I telling the buyer that's competing with multiple people? Is yeah. that the question? Okay, so honestly, we're going to have to go in strong. You know, you try to set the bar early. On the first meeting, I'm going to say, hey, listen, I'll tell you if a house is way overpriced. Normally, they're not. Normally, agents are pricing houses right, and they're probably going to go over asking right now. And it'll sound crazy like you in Birmingham, you have it where a situation where they're going 100,000 over, they're going 150,000 over, which sounds crazy. But if I know, say I'm a listing agent, I know a house is worth 400,000. If I, if I price it at 300,000, which I honestly wouldn't, but say I price it at 300,000, it should go 100,000 over. Because basically mm -hmm. buyers out there know that, hey, this house is worth more than 300,000. So, you know, it, it sounds bad, but, you know, you, that's why you need that experienced agent to show you, hey, this is where it probably is going to sell. And, and so that's the thing. So I guess, you know, if I'm working with a buyer, um, it's a house price that say it's at $200,000. i am going to do my research to find out exactly what's been selling in that neighborhood, how much appreciation I think didn't happen over the last time this other one is sold. And then I, the way the market's going, like, and I'll tell them like, hey, I think this house, that's priced at two hundred thousand. Will probably sell for two fifteen. So our first offer should probably be two fifteen. Then it come down to trust. Like, do your buyer trust you to make this offer? And not times about ten, they do. You have a few that won't, and like, no, let's come in under price, and they're not going to get it. You know what I mean? So um, that's that's kind of the norm right now. Is listening to your agent, and it depends on you. Just tell them up front, like, hey, we're going to have to make a higher offer, most likely more than the asking, and we're going to have to try to get our terms down as least as possible, or at least contingencies as possible. Like most of the, you know, cause you got a lot of cash buyers in the mar market right now. So when we're getting financed and it's taking 30, 45 days when the cash buyer can close in five days and that money can be in that seller pocket, we got to come in a little bit stronger than that cash buyer if you really want it. So okay. it, it depends on stuff, stuff like that. 
Now, that's great that you just said that because, you know, the well, next question I was going to ask you about, you know, of course, how much money do you need to put down to buy a home? What percentage now? Because I used to hear like 20% down. Has right. it kind of gone up a little bit now? Well, it depends. So mm-hmm. right now, m- normally on your second or third house that you're going to – they lenders are going to want to want you to put 20% down. And normally – you have that money from your first house to put that money down on your second house at 20% or so. However, you know, it depends. If you're comfortable with the higher mortgage payment, you can put as low as 3% down and 5% down. So you don't, you know, you can basically know it, it changes, you know, anything over, if I'm not mistaken, 500,000, you have to put 20% down. Um, it's called a jumbo loan. If I'm not mistaken, you, anything over 500, you have to put 20% down. Anything below, and I, actually, I think that price raised up a little bit. But anything below that, you can put do the three to three percent down, the five percent down, the ten percent down. You know, fifteen, whatever you want. Now, the lower your down payment, the higher your mortgage payment going to be. And of course, the higher your down payment, the lower your mortgage payment is going to be. Um, most of the time, I suggest to my buyers, hey, you know, you're making eighty thousand dollars off your first house. Keep some of that cash in the bank. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. most of the time, you can put that money in the bank. And put it on auto pay. You can pay your payment for the next three years without, you know, coming out your pocket, basically. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I normally suggest keeping that money in the bank, you know, personally, just for, you know, a rainy day fund, um, whatever you want to do. Pay off your car loan, you know, pay Mm -hmm. off, you know, something like that. But, yeah, so it's not it's not 20 percent anymore. And honestly, for first time home buyers, a lot of times, you know, it's stuff out there where you can do zero percent down. So you're not putting down any down payment. Um, you know, as long as you qualify that for that type of loan, you can, you know, get things of that sort. So it's plenty of stuff out there for home buyers right now. Okay, so say we p- put some down and our offer is rejected. What do you suggest the next step would be if that person is still interested in that home? Um, so if it's rejected, normally, you know, it's probably went with another offer, which honestly, your best bet at that time is asking for a back, you know, hey, can we be the backup offer? saying that, hey, if anything go wrong with your first offer, we'll sign the contract and you'll come to us first, basically. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of your best bet if you're, you know, if your offer is rejected. Um, other than that is you, you're moving on, trying to find something else, basically. All right. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, when it comes to, like, home inspection, should you order one? You know, what would you advise your clients on that when it comes to that step? So we always suggest a home inspection. Um, any good realtor should normally because um, basically your home is going to be your the your your highest financial asset that you buy, you know, in your life normally. Um, mm-hmm. So, you you know, and it can be a brand new home and you will still suggest a home inspection because it's somebody that's going to crawl through the attic, check out all the outlets do everything that a realtor is not a professional at basically, you know, so you can, and it's really just telling you the condition of the house. It's not going to be any perfect home inspection, brand new houses. They show it with a couple, you know, small things on there. It's Uh just showing you the condition of the house. And it's just so you have a, you can sleep better at night knowing that you made a sound investment, you know, especially with stuff like mold, you know, you would hate to buy a house and it have some hidden mold in it. And, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, inspectors are not 100% accurate. They're not going to find everything. But they normally can tell you, hey, there's moisture in this area. You might want to get it checked out by somebody else, you know, and lead you in the right direction, basically. So it's something I'm always going to suggest. Um, a lot of times nowadays, people are putting in offers not contingent on home inspection, which is a big thing to, you know, it's a big struggle because I'm always going to suggest it. But it's one way you can do it. So say you really love this house and offers are due three days from now. You can try to get an inspector in before you put your offer down. And so that's why you already know the condition and you can make the offer not contingent on inspection, which make your offer a lot stronger than the one that is. Okay. And now we finally got to closing day. What are the things, you know, of course you want everything to go right on closing day. What are some things you've seen in your experience that sometimes may hold up the process or may throw off the, you know, cancel the sale all together? Um, And now it haven't, have it to me yet knock on wood i always try to do that <laughs> but people buying so 
you know, people are, some people will go out and buy a car right before they're closing their home. Well, it's a big no-no to get any new debt when you're going through the lender process. Basically, they, um, now it has happened somebody quit their job before. Normally, the lender's going to call a couple of days before closing to make sure everything is still the same as you told them at the beginning of the process. No new net, no new debt. You making sure you still have your job, which sounds crazy, but it happens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and it's that's one thing that can just completely blow a deal up right there at the end. Um, little things. And this is something that, you know, it don't happen a lot, but honestly, 50 percent of the time. And I don't understand it to this day, and I wish I did. But so say, a, um, say you know, the seller is selling the house. Um, the buyer did an inspection like, hey, do these three things, mm -hmm. um, you know, three small things that might cost the seller, let's say $400. Mm -hmm. The seller is making, say the seller making $50,000 off the sale, and they'll still get mad and not do the things that cost $400 right. Mm -hmm. So then the, then you have a final walkthrough with the buyer and the buyer like says, hey, this isn't done right. It's not done as good as enough. And, you know, mm -hmm. since you haven't done it right, we don't want to close until this is done right. So that'll blow something up at the end, too. You know, it's a it's a couple. You know, those are just things that's right off the top of the head that could blow up a deal. But the biggest thing, I think, across the board is just people creating new debt um, or quitting their jobs right before closing. And, you know, it can be something that innocently done. Um, you start in a new role in your job where that changes your job, you know, it changes your pay. It's doing something like that, doing the process could mess up, you know, and it's something that people don't think about, but could happen. So those are probably the biggest things I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, my last two before I go to a little, little bonus segment, I want to bring up a little about selling is okay. um, how can they get in contact with you? Um, people can call me. Um, I don't, most of, all of my business is referral. So basically I have previous clients referring new clients and that's how I continue to get my business. Um, personally, I think it's the best way to get business because normally you get a client who already trusts you. Um, but I mean, you can call me at 251-243-5259. I still got my mobile number. I've, I've had it the whole time, but so I just decided yes. to keep it. <laughs> so, so that is my real number. Um, people can email me at btjrealestate at gmail.com. Um, you know, or hit me up on social media, which a lot of people do. You would, you'd be surprised. Um, a lot of sellers, they'll hit me up in a Facebook message like, Hey, we're looking to sell, you know? And, um, you know, just to, I guess, give, give my two cents on myself. I try to pride myself in communication. Um, I'm going to either text or call you right back. Normally, if I don't answer the phone, um, I'm going to do stuff when I say I'm going to do it. You know, even if it's at midnight, if I tell you it's going to get done today, it's going to get done today, you know? So that's one thing I think I bring to the table. And I think that's one thing, one reason I've been successful thus far is because I kind of, I, I just have great communication with my clients, whether it's good or bad news, I'm, I'm going to be communicating it to you. Okay. And you answered my question, which was um, why people should choose you. What are some things people should not, this final question, what should some people should not look for in a realtor? Well, I mean, it's a lot of people in real estate right now. Like I'm full time and I'm not knocking anybody. When I first got in, it was kind of semi part time, which I wouldn't get any business in either. But mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of people that jump in this real estate game to try to make a quick buck and get out. And honestly, um, and you, you see it all the time. And that's one thing I love about my company. I'm at ARC Realty, ARC Realty. It's called a, re a relationship company. Um, we have a lot of most of our full our agents are full time agents. So they're strictly about their work. Um, most of the time I see part-time agents, like I said, getting in to make a quick buck and they, they do just a terrible job. You know, you can tell the whole time that they are strictly doing this job to make the money and get, you know, and move on to the next transaction. And that's one thing I tell my clients, like not to brag, but I'm not in this for the money. You know, I'm in this to try to be the best realtor I can be. If I get paid well doing it, that's another, that's a plus on the job. Um, and that's one thing I think I'll tell people, look, make sure, um, your realtor is basically, this is not a side gig for your realtor. You're trusting, you're trusting someone with the biggest asset that you'll buy, biggest financial asset you'll purchase, um, investment you'll make. And it's their side gig. You know what I mean? Not to knock any realtor that, you know, they're trying to come full time, but normally, you know, when you got 
a young person in the game that's trying to make some money, you can definitely tell. You know what I mean? Um, and that that's something that kind of frustrates me at a, as a full time realtor. Um, it frustrates me even when I first got in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, don't you know? Don't get into something to try to make a lot mm-hmm. of money. Like, it should be backwards. Get in to try to be the best, and the money will come. And I feel like people get in trying to make a lot of money. And like, we'll worry about the quality of the, you know, of the profession later. And I just think it's, it's, it's bad for that person and bad for that client who's trusting them to either purchase or sell their house, basically. So that was, that's something I would, that would probably just the top thing in my head of what to look for, you know, when you're looking for a real estate agent. All right. Well, Brian, yeah. thanks for coming on. I want to give them for another bonus segment, you all. Uh, real quick, um, y'all stay tuned for it. But thank you all for watching uh, What's Happening Birmingham podcast. Please check out our website. Please check out my YouTube channel for more videos. Thank y'all again and have a great day. Bye bye. Right. Thank you for watching the What's Happening Birmingham video podcast. Please check out our website, app, or subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest videos today.